Hey. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. So I'm JB. I'm the developer lead for the tools for Unity. And we are, and I'm here with John. Yeah, so I'm a program manager. I'm on the Visual Studio team for Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Mac and working on the Visual Studio tools for Unity. And John is visiting, is visiting us from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, yep. I'm in town for the week for this. Thank out with you. Thank you for visiting us. So do you like the campus? I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really nice here. Yes. Uh, lots of fun things to do, nice people to meet. So it's good. I've had a good time. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm the developer lead for the tools for Unity where we're bridging Unity, the game engine, and our developer tools. And today we'll be talking about exactly this, making game with .NET, uh, using Visual Studio, Unity, and John, you're going to talk a little bit about PlayFab afterwards. Yeah, so we'll talk about PlayFab, uh, exactly. All right, so let's start, uh, let's start with Unity, because uh, this is .NET Conf. Not everybody is familiar with what Unity is. Uh, so if we're going to the slide, Unity claims that uh, Unity is the most widely used real-time 3D development platform. Uh, what does it mean is that Unity is a tool that you can use to build all kinds of experiences, 2D, 3D games, and uh, you can use Unity to build games for more than 25 platforms from mobiles, iOS, Android, console, Xbox, PlayStation, uh, to AR, VR experiences, including HoloLens, and, uh, and even to the web now. OK, so we can target pretty much everything under the sun. Pretty much. Uh, and the reason why we're here at .NET Conf is that the real nice thing about Unity is that you get to reuse your .NET and C-sharp skills and the Visual Studio ecosystem of tools to build your game. OK, so I'm a .NET developer. I'm on .NET Comp. And maybe I want to make some games so I can reuse my existing knowledge on how to use C-sharp and .NET and also work with Visual Studio, something I'm familiar with. Exactly. So you need to get Unity to learn about Unity, but you get to reuse all the skills uh, that you build uh, to learn .NET and C-sharp to build those games. OK, awesome. All right, so if I'm a .NET developer and I want to get started, well, what's the best way to get started? It's actually very easy. The best way to get started is to head to unity3.com and download and install Unity. Uh, it comes uh, as an installer for uh, Windows, for Mac, and it's going to set up everything that you need uh, from Unity itself to Visual Studio that will be configured on Windows and on Visual Studio for Mac with everything that you need to build, write, and debug your Unity games uh, using Visual Studio. And if you want, and if you're a complete beginner uh, when it comes to games, uh, like I am myself, <laughs> the best thing to do is to head over unity3.com slash learn. Uh, it's the learning section of the Unity website. They have tutorials from how to get started with a very simple scene with just like a sphere or a cube to FPS games or multiplayer games. They have tutorials for pretty much everything, and it's free. OK, so I can download Unity. I can get started with a bunch of free content. Uh, maybe you can show me. Like, yeah, exactly. See what, so see what that looks like. let's, uh, let's get started with uh, Unity. So this is. Right, so this is a program which is named uh, Unity Hub that you can also install to manage your different Unity installations if you're using multiple of them. So we're going to go ahead and create a new Unity project. And it's uh, basically as easy as that. Unity will create an entire project with everything that you need for your game. OK. So we create our project from Unity. That's correct. Visual Studio. Uh, that's correct. Unity has its own concept of what a project is. And only Unity knows uh, what it needs in a project. Uh, so you don't start using Visual Studio by doing like a new Unity project. You launch Unity, you create a new project, 
And from there, you'll be able to generate a Visual Studio project uh, to modify your code of your game. OK. I see some chat. Can't hear me. Is that any better now? Let me know in the chat. All right, so we're waiting for Unity to run this. Looks like yes. it's going to create our project here. It's about to finish. Uh, what Unity is actually doing is creating this entire project structure uh, where you'd be able to store your assets, like your 3D models, uh, your sound, uh, even the code of your game. And Unity here is also getting a set of pre-built resources called packages uh, that are shipped with Unity uh, so that you can use them directly without having to download anything else. Okay. So it takes a little bit of time, and that's what you get. Uh, obviously, it's very different from Visual Studio. It's almost its own entire IDE, and that's where Unity developers are spending the most uh, of their time. So you have your scene view, which is basically where you create the visuals of your game, or at least like assemble them. Uh, you're, not you're not really going to create models uh, from there. The philosophy of Unity is that Unity aggregates different kind of assets. So you can use something like Blender to create a 3D model or 3D Studio. And then you're going to import it uh, inside Unity. And it's the same for any kind of, of asset, like a texture that you would work with in Photoshop, for instance. And you add that to Unity. And that's inside Unity that you put everything together. Okay. So on the left, you have the hierarchy of your game, in which we have a directional light that illuminates the scene. You have the main camera, and you can go to the game view to see what the camera views. And we can add like a 3D object. I don't know, let's add a sphere in the game. And you have the inspector on your right, which gives you all the properties that you can apply uh, to your objects, and, and you have your game view. And if you play, well, it's a very simple game, but it's a start. Like you have like a 3D spheres, a 3D sphere in your game. And the real nice thing about Unity is that you can change pretty much everything uh, on the fly. You can move things around, and you immediately see what's happening inside your game from the game view. And it's a very iterative process of creating a game where you move things around, you see what works. You can even change the code of your game on the fly, and Unity will pick it up. And it makes for a very simple development experience compared to the traditional way of building game with the main loop, and you recompile your entire game before trying it. Unity makes it really easy to tweak things uh, and see them live without having to go through the entire pipeline of recompiling everything. OK, all right, so we can do everything kind of live and iterative. Uh, I mean, earlier we talked about Visual Studio. So where does Visual Studio come into play in this whole .NET and C-sharp thing? Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. All right. How do you oh. put it back? So let's go back to the slide one second. Yeah. So yeah, uh, in, in Visual Studio, do we have the slides? Yes. Yeah, there they are. All right. Um, so as I was saying, uh, Unity, when you install it, is going to set up Visual Studio for you. And one of the things that Unity is going to install and is something called the Visual Studio tools for Unity, just like we have tools for Xamarin or we have uh, tools for Azure or other scenarios. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, plugin and workload for Unity and in Visual Studio on Windows and Visual Studio for Mac. Uh, we call it VSTU sometimes, and uh, you'll find me use VSTU. OK, so uh, how, do, how do I get this? If I'm a developer in Visual Studio, how do I get VSTU? So if you're a developer in Visual Studio and you've installed Visual Studio yourself, like the best way is to launch the Visual Studio installer, which has this concept of workloads now, where you can install everything that you need for different scenarios. And we have the game development with Unity workload, a workload dedicated to Unity development. Uh, that will install everything that you need to write and debug your Unity game for Visual Studio, uh, including the tools for Unity. And, uh, and on Windows, it's directly included in the box when you download Unity. When you download Visual Studio, it has the tools for Unity built in so that when you select Visual Studio for Mac or uh, as the C-sharp editor in Unity, everything will be picked up and just work. Okay. 
So I can, it's already included in Visual Studio for Mac. And if I so want to install, it's in Visual Studio for Mac. Yeah, it's just a checkbox in the Visual Studio installer to include Unity. Uh, on Windows, yes. On Windows, it's, right. You just check the game development with Unity workflow. Uh, but if you went through what we said, if you got like Unity first and that it installed Visual Studio for you as well, uh, everything is ready to go. Okay, awesome. All right, so maybe you can tell me about what are some of the features that we include um, in sure. Visual Studio. So what we're trying to achieve with uh, the Visual Studio tools for Unity is to make sure that you can reuse all the skills uh, and knowledge that you built of Visual Studio to write and debug your game. And we're trying to make the experience uh, as smooth as possible so that you have no interruption. Uh, so I think it's probably easier if we just uh, take a look take a look at, okay. uh, yes, at what look. it does, and then we can go through the specific features that the tools for Unity provide for Unity game developers. Great, yeah, let's take a look. All right. All right. While you're switching that, um, I see a question in the chat. How can Unity work on the web, and what's, what are the requirements? All right, so Unity uh, does work on the web, and it's just another target uh, that you can pick. Uh, so let me just uh, show you this window. When you're, th so we've seen Unity, that's where you build your game. Uh, you create it, uh, as we said, it's very iterative. And when you're happy enough with the game, you export it for target platform. Say so you want to export it to UWP, it's going to create a Visual Studio solution for UWP. And uh, you target iOS, it's going to create an, Xbox, uh, an Xcode project. And if you target the web, it's going through a pretty complex uh, compilation pipeline and transformation process where ultimately it ends up being where the entire Unity engine and like the code of your game ends up being converted uh, mm -hmm. to WebAssembly that runs in the browser. Okay. Uh, it ends up like, so they're, they're not really, it's a kind of like small Unity games, like they end up being, you, you still have to download like a game engine uh, and assets. So, so that's not really used to build very lightweight games yet. Uh, Unity is working on that, but right now if you target WebAssembly, the web is going to go through that process and produce like a web assembly game. Okay, awesome. All right. All right. So we're taking a look at how Visual Studio so, and coding, so let's take a look. Yeah, so this is Unity with a project which is just a little bit more elaborate than the one we've seen before. Uh, it looks more complicated because there are trees, there's an object in the middle, uh, but realistically it's, it's not really that much more complicated. The only thing that I've done is I've been to something called the Asset Store, and the Asset Store inside Unity is uh, it's this window, and you can think of it. Uh, Let me oh. go. I think I don't think we're sharing our screen here. Let me go back. We're to not. This. No, let's go back, and we'll share. Oh. There you go. All oh, right. Thank good. you. Sorry about, Sorry that. about that. Uh, so the asset store, you can think of it like as an app store on your phone, but instead of getting apps, you, get, you can get any kind of assets that you need to build a game. So if you're like me, have no talent to build 3D models or paint textures or create sounds, uh, you can get started to create the games that you have in your mind using assets that you get either for free or that you buy on the asset store. Uh, and it's very convenient to, ver to prototype something very easily and make sure that it looks nice before investing strongly uh, in the art of your game. When you and you can use it to validate like, the the ideas that you have of your game uh, using assets. Okay, so and maybe I want to get like some placeholder content or something, or uh, maybe just I don't have the time to build a model, or maybe even the skill to sure. go to the asset store and pick up something. You can use it for that, but I, I don't want to diminish what you can get on the asset store. You can get very nice quality. Okay. Assets also. It's not only like place uh, orders. Okay. Uh, that's, so the way, that's the way I use it myself, like when I want to do something like this. Uh, but you get real pro assets uh, that would not look bad in a triple A game. Oh, so even if I want to add it in my finished product, I could, yeah, I could go the whole you way could. out. Yeah, okay, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I've downloaded two assets, uh, one which is called Nature Starter Kit uh, that provides you with trees. Uh, and grass and that kind of visual. And I've opened their simple scene, and that's what you get. And I've downloaded a 3D model for Flying Saucer, 
Uh, and I just drag and dropped it to Unity. Unity imported it. I applied the texture on the saucer, and it was ready to go. So this is my scene. If I switch to the game view, that's what I get. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's looking good. It's, it's actually looking great. And the way it does that is by adding special effects on the camera, like vignetting or like blurring and having like a field of view. And all those effects are built into Unity. Like you can use it for free. And you go from something that looks a little bit plain. And by simply using like scripts that are provided by Unity, you can drastically improve the visuals of your game. So again, this is a sample scene that I open and download it from the asset store, a simple 3D model, and I have already have something that already looks really nice. Okay. And so if you play the game, so it's not really a game, it's more like a scene. Then I have my flying saucer, which uh, rotates and hovers uh, over the ground. Nice. So how did you make that type of interaction with that object? What exactly is involved with that? So scripting. Anytime you, you're going to want to program something in your game, you're going to use a scripting. And ultimately, that means writing c -sharp code for Unity. So this is uh, the hierarchy of my game. Uh, and I have my saucer object. And on the inspector for this object, we can see this, its position in the world, its rotation. Uh, but we can also see that I added like a saucer rotation script. So if I double click on it, it takes me directly to, unit, to Visual Studio with the script opened. And it means that this script is attached to this 3D object in the world. So this is C-sharp. Uh, we can recognize a few things as uh, C-sharp developers and a few things that are uh, different and particular to the way Unity does things. The first thing is on the right. This is the Unity Project Explorer. And as I was saying earlier, Unity has a different concept of what a project is compared to traditional Visual Studio projects. Visual Studio projects are built around solution and project files. Unity are built uh, around uh, folders. You have one main folder where you, where you have all your assets. Uh, different teams could contribute different assets uh, in different folders and arrange them this way. And basically, you'll be browsing it uh, like folder base. And that, okay. like the default way it, with the Solution Explorer is to view the different projects that Unity generates to represent what Unity is going to do when it compiles your game internally. Uh, but we're providing this tool window to make sure that it's as easy to navigate into your uh, game structure in Visual Studio as it is in Unity. Okay. Because so it's going to mirror exactly what uh, we're seeing in the project view of Unity okay. for your scripts. So Unity is doing something a little maybe not standard that we're used to seeing from as like a .NET developer. So the Solution yes. Explorer has some other things in there, maybe organized a little differently, and the, the project files used a little bit differently. Yes. So the Unity Project Explorer maps things to be similar to what you see in the Unity editor, so it's a little easier to go back and forth. That's correct. Okay. Yes. And we have your uh, C sharp view uh, of your code. We have uh, a bunch of fields uh, which are public, which is unusual. We're going back to that. We have a type that extends a monobehavior type, uh, which is a special type with special meaning with the Unity engine. And we have two methods, start and update. And you can see that they're colored differently. The reason is that uh, the reason why we're coloring them differently, and that's something that is provided by VSTU, is that those methods have special meaning for the Unity engine. When mm -hmm. you attach a script to a 3D object or to an object, uh, the Unity engine will look at the script and, and look at those different methods, and they're going to invoke it from the Unity engine with a special meaning. For instance, start is called when your game is starting. And for instance, Makes update sense. is going to be invoked by the Unity engine at every frame. So this code will run once when the game starts, and this will run at every frame of your game. OK, that makes sense. All right. So maybe we can look at you know, if something goes wrong, and maybe I need to debug. I mean, I'm used to debugging my project. So what exactly can I do with Unity games? It, it's very easy. So your game is running. You see that there's something wrong in, I don't know, the rotation. Uh, it, it's as easy as putting a breakpoint and attaching the debugger to Unity. And it's as simple as that. Oh, look, OK. There we go. 
you're not starting the project like you would say for Xamarin application or a WinForms application where you start the application and, and you debug it. Uh, the Unity workflow is you work, again, in a very iterative fashion from inside the Unity editor. Uh, you attach the debugger, you see what's wrong, you fix it, you tweak it, and Unity will automatically see what's changed and is going to reload it. And you'll be able to uh, replay your game in the editor with your fixes. And it's as simple as that. And so in terms of debugging, you have pretty much everything that you expect from the normal .NET debugging experience. Uh, you, can, you can step, uh, you can view your variables, uh, everything that you need to debug your game. You have your core stack. Okay, I mean, everything's there. Everything's there. Yeah, it looks, looks great. All right. All right, so let's remove this breakpoint boot because we're going to eat it at every frame, and sure. let's keep the game running. Uh, so let's stop debugging. Uh, so let's go back to that. Uh, so as I was saying, we have uh, those are special methods uh, which which are only identified by name, so it's making it sometimes difficult uh, to remember them. So the tools for Unity are providing two things uh, to make it easier. The first one is the mono behavior wizard. Uh, it's especially practical for beginners uh, which are learning Unity and don't know all the different methods that they need to declare in their mono behaviors to get started. And we let them just create them just at the click of a button. And so say you want to handle the collision on the saucer at some point, mm. you just declare, you just use the wizard and you declare on collision enter. And that's where you get started. So this is kind of an example of maybe a productivity feature. Yes. Uh, you know, maybe I don't remember what the method names are. Uh, be able to generate them and get some documentation there. Exactly, and it's going to uh, give you a brief extra of what is when the Unity engine is going to call them. Say you want to learn more about the Collision API. One thing that you can do is simply go to L to the Unity API reference. And it's going to open the Unity documentation directly for the types that you've selected. Oh, OK. Yeah, I mean, I'm always finding myself kind of searching for the API and learn how I can use it. So I can do this right inside the editor. Exactly. And right. uh, another thing uh, that we're doing, as we mentioned, uh, Unity has its own concept of what a project is, which means that every time you're going to uh, Add a new script, Unity is going to recreate those project files that represent what Unity is doing to Visual Studio so that you get like code completion. Uh, one thing that we've uh, done recently is make VSTU smart about it. So it's going to monitor the project files and only reload what's necessary so that you're not prompted all the time. So anytime you, you add a new script to Unity, Previously, you were prompted, oh, do you want to reload the solution? Do you want to reload the product? Do you want to discard the changes? Uh, VSTU is now smart about it, and it is going to reload exactly what you need so that your visual experience always represents what Unity is doing internally. OK. So I can transfer back and forth, you know, kind of that workflow you're talking about, where I need to go back and forth between Unity and Visual Studio and be able to do that seamlessly. Exactly. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's what uh, the tools for Unity are providing. Uh, one last thing I wanted to show is, uh, is about the scripts. Uh, as I was saying earlier, all right, let's go back to Visual Studio. We have those public fields, uh, which are unusual for C Sharp developers, but, sh but they are actually a way for Unity developers to modify the behavior of some script. So they're effectively default values, and Unity is going to look at the script, look at the public field, and represent them in the UI. So it gives you a way to very quickly tweak some parameters uh, of your game. So say I want to change like the speed of the rotation. I want to make it uh, like slower. I just tweak it there and see what it means. Oh, so, okay. And see so what it does to the game. So I can do every kind of tweak my game at runtime. And exactly. And it, and it makes it very easy to, I don't know, like play around with like the health of an enemy that you're battling uh, in your game or change like the power uh, of a gun or whatever you're building. Yeah. You just expose a few parameters and you can tweak them very easily in your game. Okay, great. Well, uh, while we're talking about that, I see a question in the chat about, uh, it's confusing, typically won't these mono behavior overrides be protected virtuals? So I think we're talking about those yeah. start and update methods, maybe in the .NET world you're used to being able to override something. Yes, so that's, 
I, I think we can say it's a quirk, well, which is specific to Unity. Uh, they're not declaring uh, those methods as virtual. Uh, one reason is that game developers have this fear of virtual methods because they've been told that virtual methods are slow. Mm. <laughs> So they're just looking for it by name and directly invoking them as a standard method call, uh, which also means that you can use the uh, the IDE to override the method or at least find which method you need to override, which is why we have the mono behavior wizard where you can select them. And something that we built like to go around the fact that it's not an override method uh, is that if you're inside a mono behavior, uh, we've added from the IntelliSense the list of mono behaviors that you can declare, like the list of messages that you can respond to in your mono behavior. So say you implemented on collision enter, uh, you want to have an, another on collision exit. Uh, it's directly accessible from the IntelliSense. You press enter, and okay. we're going to add it. So we don't you. really lose any functionality there, the fact that they've No, it, it's just something that you have to learn. Right. But, the, but the, the tools for Unity are going to provide you with ways to work around the fact that they're not declared as uh, virtual methods. Right, okay, that makes sense. All right. All right, let's see what, so what are we gonna look at next? Maybe go back to the slides here and take All a look. right. So one thing that I wanted to talk about uh, was Unity and Visual Studio. Oh, this one? Yep. So, are we full screen? Yep, yep. We good. all right. Uh, Unity ships pretty much every week, uh, and they have like three to four major releases a year. So we're not going to go into the detail of everything that's changing in Unity and all the efforts they're doing to go like from triple A, like quality of graphics to like 2D uh, pixel perfect games. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is what's new in Unity for .NET developers, because this is .NET Conf. And one thing that has been brewing for the last year, like if you've been doing like Unity development, uh, you will have noticed that uh, from inside Unity, the default right now is that you're targeting .NET 3.5 using C Sharp 4. And this is .NET Conf. We are already starting to discuss about C Sharp 8 in the future. Uh, everything that's new in .NET 4.7, everything that's new in .NET .NET Stellar 2, and Unity for a long time has been using this version of Mono uh, as a .NET runtime uh, that offers a .NET 3.5 API and C Sharp 4. Uh, so realistically, Unity developers haven't, haven't been able to use like, all the niceties uh, and everything that shipped since basically all those versions in .NET 4 and .NET 4.5. Right, and so C -sharp years, five, of, six, years of fixes. Years of new features. And when it comes to Mono, the open source .NET implementation that uh, Unity uses uh, to run the script, well, uh, they've now introduced in Unity 2018 an option to use this new Mono version uh, that offers a .NET 4.7 API profile, that offers a .NET Stair 2 profile if you want to target a smaller API profile to make smaller games. But it also comes with years of bug fixes and performances as that the model team has been doing. For instance, for Xamarin, one big feature that uh, come and performance improvement that come with the model update is debugger improvements, um, where basically attaching the debugger to this mono runtime uh, would be much faster. And so are we getting those benefits with the Unity projects as well? And no, uh, Unity is bringing this new model version to run the script for the Unity games, and you're getting all of that by simply choosing from Unity to pick this new .NET version. Okay, so we can use .NET 4.7, .NET Standard 2.0. Exactly, uh, and with the in Unity 18.3, which is currently in beta, uh, and which is scheduled to ship at the end of the year, uh, they included Roslyn as the default C Sharp compiler, and they're targeting C Sharp 7. Okay which means that all the nice features, including uh, like ref calls that are uh, tailored for performance sensitive code, you'll be able to use them from your Unity game. 
Awesome. All right, so we can use all the all the nice things that we would want to use. Exactly. So cool. yeah, we're very much looking forward to that. And the VSTU team has been uh, working in cooperation with Unity to make sure that everything that they end up supporting in terms of runtime features or API profiles uh, basically just works from Visual Studio. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. So, all right, that's so kind this of a is look. Unity. Uh, this is Visual Studio, and we wanted to talk about connected games. And yeah. John, that's your part. Yeah. Um, so let me check the uh, chat here. Someone asked a question about how do you call a private method? So uh, again, with those uh, start and update, those were marked private. So yeah, so you're not calling it yourself. It's something that you can think of it as reflection in a way. Uh, and the Unity engine is going to look at uh, those private methods and invoke it uh, using like the mono, a the mono embedding APIs to make sure that the calls are actually fast, uh, not using like the system reflection API, which can be slow sometimes. So directly calling them through the mono runtime embedding APIs. Uh, that's not something that you will call yourself. Uh, as I was saying, start will be, for instance, will be called by the Unity game engine itself at the beginning of your game. So when you press play or when you exported it and, it act and the game actually starts, and the update is going to be called at every frame of your game. Okay, so these these messages are part of the like Unity API for these scripts. Yeah, and they're there are ways for it's you to hook into yeah. kind of like it's almost not like even an API, right? It's like a protocol almost right, that okay. you need to follow for Unity to talk to your script. Okay, all right. Well, I hope that answers the question. Um, is it possible to integrate a Unity's scene in a WPF app? Uh, not today. It's not. Uh, when you create a Unity game, it comes with the entire Unity engine, and Unity like act as a container for the script and not the other way around. So it has to initialize. So Unity itself initializes the entire engine, uh, and then draws like this your scene, and then calls into your game script. But you, it's not something that you can ask yourself. Okay. All right. All right, so let me talk about connected games. So we talked a little bit about like what getting started looks like. Um, what I was hoping to talk about a little bit, once you maybe get past that hurdle and you've already started your game and uh, we kind of develop games you know, today where everything is connected. Uh, maybe you want to do something multiplayer. Maybe you want to sync some data between devices or you want to dynamically configure your game or something like that. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit how you yeah, can do true. that. That's true. Like, even if you're installing a single player game, Today it will require you to be online. Yeah, I mean, what if you change devices? Yep. Um, you know, or as as a developer, maybe you want to send out an update without requiring you know a full download of the game. Maybe some configuration change or you. Does that make testing. sense? So I wanted to talk a little bit about PlayFab. Um, and exactly so what's what PlayFab? So PlayFab is like a backend platform for live games. Okay. And so that basically what it allows you to do is do a lot of backend services and makes everything really easy when you're building games. Um, so let's take a look a little bit about what we have for that. So some of the services that we have are player management. So things like identity and auth authentication. Um, some of those things are really hard to do. Maybe so like if you have a mobile game and you want to make sure that your users are logging in through Facebook, that's what you would use? Right, yeah. So there's uh, you know all the social auth providers there's an uh, abstracted API to make sure that's all pretty easy to do. Okay. Um, so you can do that across multiple platforms. Um, there's some integrations with multiplayer. Uh, there's some commerce you can set up like in-game stores and items, handle in-app purchases and set currencies and things like that. Um, and oh, like in-app purchases? Yeah. That's and, and same as for logging in and authentication, that, uh, that would be abstracted for Android in a purchases or iOS in a purchase. Right, yeah, so the PlayFab SDK will facilitate all that for you. Nice. Um, so you have a way to do that. And then maybe you want to add a leaderboard to your game. Of course. Uh, something something simple, maybe you're getting started, you just want to have a leaderboard. So there's a simple Just so you APIs. can compete with everybody. Right, yeah, <laughs> you want to compete with everybody. Um, there's also real-time analytics, um, so you can get data kind of real-time coming in, so you can create events, you know, anything you want to do, the player logs in, or maybe they level up, or any type okay. of data you might want to see in your game, um, you can see that information in real time, and you can. There's dashboards to view that. Uh, there's ways to run reports on that. So you're launching your game, and day one you can see everybody who starts playing and like, as they are progressing inside the game. Exactly. That's pretty right. sweet. Right. So you could do all that um, real time too, which is really nice. So uh, you can quickly respond to things that how they're changing in your community. 
Um, and then there's some things that are called uh, some live op features, um, like you can send out email messaging to your community. You could provide content updates. So if you maybe you want to provide uh, new experiences in your game and not require someone to fully update the game. So you want like some downloadable content packs or something uh, like a DLC. Oh, nice. Something like Without that. Without having to users like to update the game itself. Sure. You could also use that maybe to deliver content dynamically. Like so your, your client of your game could be lightweight and you could download like more assets. Like, okay. Uh, you know, sometimes you start up a game and there's a little bit of a loading in the beginning to download yep. all the assets, but the actual download of the game was uh, small, like for mobile. Um, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of systems to include that. Nice. And then, you know, in-game events or promotions you want to run within your game, there's ways to manage all that within PlayFab. So it makes a lot of all these kinds of ways to manage a community and your game and, and make money and handle all that. It has all these different suite of products to handle all that, so. So yeah, that's, like your backend for your connected game. Exactly. Um, right. So one of the scenarios maybe I wanted to show off this a little bit is you're working in a game and you want to dynamically configure it. Okay. Um, so you have some configuration data like, you know, I have a player and I have some health or something and uh, I want to set that up on my server. So if I ever need to change that, I have to, I can do that, you know, on the back end and then my game client can sync that information. And so download thought, it without uh, having, like for you to push an update of your game. Exactly. Yeah, and maybe you're, and maybe even you're in development, and you know you want to do it for your beta testers, and, not, and be able Makes to do sense. all that stuff, and you know, respond real time, and be able to, to change these types of things. So um, one way to do that with PlayFab is a concept called title data. So title being kind of like a term for your game, mm -hmm. um, and then it's basically just key value storage. Um, so you can easily set up key value storage. Uh, you know, it's designed for configuration data that doesn't change like rapidly but something that you could tweak or change you know, as and you're push developing. To, and push to your user base. Yeah, and push to your user base that way. So let me show you All what right. that looks like. So let me jump in here to our other scene. All right. So this is basically the same thing that we had before. before. Yeah. yeah, so I have my saucer and let's take a your look. Beautiful here. saucer. Yeah, let me run this, make some more room here. All right. Let's switch. Oh, yeah. let's switch to the game view. Yes, yeah, so let me make some more room so we can see our scene. That's so beautiful. same thing we had before. Um, so let me just give you a quick thing, a uh, tour of what I changed. So one thing I did is I installed the PlayFab editor extensions. So it's an open source uh, package you can download that. How do you get you, that? Uh, it's on the website. And you just right. go to like a, a PlayFab and Unity and um, then I'll take you to the GitHub page and give you the Unity package. Oh, and you just click on that, import it. You import it in your product and you're ready to Yeah, go. so it's like an asset, same thing we talked about uh, using from the asset store. And it gives you this little window right here. Um, and then the SDK tab, if you don't already have it installed, you can just click Install SDK. Oh, and nice. it will install the PlayFab SDK for you and make sure that everything is up to date. Oh, so they even have a bootstrap or so that you can like update like the SDK. Exactly. That's pretty sweet. So you can kind of manage it within the Unity editor, which makes it nice. Um, so here is the title data I was talking about. You right. can see so I, have a, you have? I have a couple key value storage things mm -hmm. here. So I have amplitude, degrees per second, and frequency. And if we go back, uh, let me open up the C sharp project here. Right. So degrees per second maps to like the degrees per second of rotation of the saucer, and amplitude of frequency is like of the over movement uh, that we had previously. Yeah. So these were the variables that you had made yep. public yep. and you were showing in the inspector, and we were tweaking them in the inspector. But you know that's local to the development machine yep. um, that we're doing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to push those variables to PlayFab as title data, yep. and then I'll be able to change them on the back end, and so then our game client will sync with that. So that if players were like playing this game like live, like you could push like new changes and new configuration to them. Yeah, I mean, maybe this isn't a terribly interesting scenario, but you could think yep. of uh, you were running, you know, health, player health or something, and yep. maybe their spawn health was too high. You learned from you know analyzing some of your events, and your um, player so you never died. Right, so <laughs> right. So you could go back in and tweak that on the back end, and then the next time the game client launches, you could you yep. could be syncing that data, so uh, you could tweak those type of values. Okay. So you can take a look here. Um, All right. So, so that's here's what we, here's what we have. So we call the PlayFab client API. Okay. Um, and has built, you know, method built in uh, for get client title data, and then 
we just parse the result to get our key value stored. So it returns a result with key value. So very value. easy, yes. Yeah, so very simple. And One API call, um, like using the keys that you set in the configuration, like automatically play fab well, like get the right ones for you. Right, exactly. Very nice. Um, and this key value storage is just two strings, so you can make them whatever you want. So when maybe your game scales, you could make the values like full JSON values. Yep. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. So you could really make this um, sophisticated as you scale. All right. So right now I set these, uh, the default values are what's running. So mm -hmm. if we go here and we just hit update, which is going to call that API, you can see now. All right, it's slowing everything it's slowed down. Slowed everything down. I changed the values. And that's because the amplitude I set to two. Um, and what these values are here, is if we go back into yeah, it makes for this. So here's the PlayFab portal, and here's the title data. So here's what I did on the back end. So here's the two, yep. and I changed the degrees per second. Um, you can do it here in the PlayFab website mm -hmm. um, on the back end too, or for some of these things, you can do right here right. in yeah, the like editor from the extensions. Like Unity extension directly. Right, and that will sync it to the back end for you. So it allows you to not have to leave the editor when you're doing stuff like this, which is kind of nice if you're the developer nice. working on this. You yep. can also view it as well, uh, which is really cool. It so makes for a less menacing saucer. Right. So that's kind <laughs> of a that's kind of a basic look of how you might use something like title data um, in oh. PlayFab to dynamically configure um, or deliver configuration to your And game. it shows the entire point of PlayFab that it's very easy to call something like their API, which is going to abstract a lot of things from you, from authentication to or the communication to your backend and the JSON parsing. Right, exactly. Um, so something uh, that I, I can show some more of that. Um, but if you want to learn more about PlayFab, you can go to playfab.com slash features, and you can take a look at that, um, and you'll see everything that's available there. Um, nice. So Do we have time for Yeah, I think we have a more few demo? minutes here. All I'll right. show you one more demo of something that's cool. So we have this uh, sample here that's a Unity game. It's called Unicorn Battle. And I'll, I'll just show a little bit maybe more of a full story of how PlayFab and uh, can be used for like an actual game project. Okay. So let's launch this and we'll do it windowed. You can see it's made with Unity. Yep. Powered by PlayFab. Beautiful. All right, so we'll go in here. Um, so you, you can set up all the authentication too, but I'm gonna skip that for the demo here. Um, so here's what we have. So this is like my character selection screen. Mm -hmm. And you can see here, I already made a character, but <laughs> more interestingly, let's look at like a new character. And you have some different um, unicorn types here that you can select. <laughs> and you can see these abilities and like starting stats that I yep. might want to have in my game. Um, on the back end. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet that's something you can configure. Yeah, <laughs> so if you look here at like this classes record here, um, if we look at the JSON for that. Oh, you nice. can see. Like, yeah, you can even have complex JSON objects. In yeah, here. so here's an example of like me uploading a full JSON file. Um, maybe it's a little small, but uh, you can see there's like, here's Bob, here's Nightmare. Um, yeah, maybe that helps nope. uh, to see that. So you can see like I could change any of these values for the game that I want. So there's all like the starting values uh, for the game. So that's pretty cool. Let me take a look here. That's really so nice. If we create, well, I'll just go to my existing character here and click on play. So here's my character. Uh, once you create your character, you can go back here and you can see, OK, here's my character that I created named Roach. Um, you can see everything that my character has. Uh, let me go into character classes here. All oh, right. So I think in my inventory, Oh, I got rid of it. Let me go back. <laughs> to That's a complete game. Yeah, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, well, it's not here anymore, but let's take a look at this. So this is like an inventory, so you can handle inventory. You can create items. Um, so here's alfalfa juice. And there's a bunch of items in here. Um, so like crystal container was the one I was going to show you. That's like a chest. Um, let's see if... Uh, so do you have public samples of PlayFab that uh, people can run? Yeah, there's uh there are some samples you can find on there. Um, I'm on not. The sure, I don't think the unicorn battle is a public sample. I have to okay. double check on that. Um, but yeah, there's there's lots of learning material. There's a lot of tutorials, especially for Unity. Uh, PlayFab also. Yeah. yeah uh, it also supports um, multiple platforms. So if you're not building with Unity and maybe you want to 
work on some other engine, you can also do that too. There's there's SDKs for uh, you know multiple game platforms and also different languages. Um, nice. So yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. So let's see if we have any questions for anybody. If there's anything in there. No, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> right. As someone who started gaming with text-based mods, being able to create my own video games at some with graphics still messes with my head. Yeah, I know. Like when I look at Unity, I mean, if I had if I had Unity when I was like 15, I would have even been a bigger nerd. I would have never <laughs> left home, I think, and I would have spent countless hours just building worlds with Unity. It makes it so easy. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's kind of why I got into it too, because it makes it easy. Yeah. Um, you could take, you know, my background being with .NET and Visual Studio, I wanted to, of course, reuse that knowledge and then being able to do it with Unity uh, made it really easy for me to transition into kind of tinkering with games. You know, I saw someone mention in the chat they wanted to do it as like a hobby. It's perfect. Yeah. You know, try it out. It's free. Um, PlayFab is free. Um, you can get started with that in Visual Studio. Like you can use Visual Studio Community free. as well. So I mean, there's really, you know, there's low risk. You know, yeah. do it, try it out. Um, you send us questions. Uh, you know, JB and I yeah. are both on Twitter. And I think, well, that's the best conclusion you can get. It's easy to reuse your C Sharp and .NET skills as .NET developers to build very high quality game using Unity and PlayFab on the back end. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much, right. everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Hey, everybody. We're live from Studio C and Channel 9 Studios. And we're done. We're done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no <laughs> more days. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. It was such a successful event. The three days mm -hmm. have been absolutely fantastic. This last 24 hours have been like crazy, right? Crazy. Yeah. Overnight, two in the morning. Thanks to James and Emma for joining yep. us in the middle yep. of the night. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Javier, a little, little statistics on the uh, community day stuff, huh? Yeah, well, not even that. I was just showing us like this, you know, the entire 24 hours were cleverly managed using a printed out spreadsheet we print and red dots. Paper. So red this dots. this is the, the, the core behind that net conf. But what I think I was going to show you was this. Ah. The history. The a history. little bit of a history so lesson here. We started long ago in 2012 with ASPConf many, many years ago. Many so years these ago. are signs that, that we, uh, we all sign each year mm -hmm. to say, look, look who participated. So there was like five people back then. That's right, because okay. the internet didn't exist back then. <laughs> the internet hardly existed. That's right. I couldn't find the 2013 one, so okay, we're so going to skip straight to 13 is unlucky number. We're going to skip to uh, first.net conf 2014 out of Channel 9. Out of Channel 9 studios. Here. Really good the old stuff. Studios. That was the actual .net brand. Com. That's oh, right. All right, all right. So we expanded. I'm running 2015. out of 2015 right here. Uh, I'm running out of yeah, space so here, bro. It's getting a little more full. I wasn't in marketing yet, so as you really? notice, not a lot of people there. I'm Ooh. running out of space, bro. This was my first dungeon. 2016. <laughs> okay. 2016, very nice. Can, can I still? There you go. Yeah. Stop. Yeah, stop. Stop. What's going on? Okay. okay. 2017. Last year was two streams. Remember that craziness? And Lots multiple of people. Multiple channels. On that you one. pick whichever. We <laughs> were in Stockholm. Like, we were in Sweden. That one was terribly crazy. Choose actually. your own adventure. Uh, it, so can I have that one too? <laughs> okay. There. Gonna, there we go. <laughs> okay, bro. And last but not okay. least, the member of, of the this family. Year, 2018. Right, on air. 2018. Okay. Tons of awesome people. What did you guys think? It was awesome. You guys huh? should do this again. <laughs> Jeff, here we go. Hang on, let me grab that one. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. All right, yeah, guys. Thanks See for watching. See you so much. See you next year. year. Bye.